our moderator tonight, uh, Victor Navasky, to my left, uh, is the former editor and published emeritus of The Nation. He's the author of many books, including Naming Names, a book that won a National Book Award, and as many of you already know, focus, uh, it's a book that you know, focuses on the Hollywood blacklist, HUAC and Joseph McCarthy. Navasky is a professor emeritus at Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism, where he taught for many years and was chairman of the Columbia Journalism Review. Earlier this year, he was awarded the IF Stone Medal for Journalistic Independence by the Neiman Foundation. Uh, thank you, Victor, for agreeing to moderate this panel. And let me introduce the rest of the panel before we officially get started. Sarah Jaffe is a Nation Institute Fellow and an independent journalist covering labor, economic justice, social movements, politics, gender, and pop culture. She is the author of Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt, which is now out, out in paperback. Her work was, uh, has appeared in The Nation, Salon, The Week, The American Prospect, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, amongst many other publications. She is the co-host with Michelle Chen of Descent Magazine's uh, Belabored podcast, as well as the editorial board member at Descent. She's also a columnist at the New Labor Forum. Jaffe was formerly a staff writer in these times and the labor editor at Alternet. She was a con uh, contributing editor at the, on the 99% How the Occupy Wall Street Movement is Changing America from Alternet Books, as well as a contributor to the n anthologies at the Tea Party and Tales of Two Cities, both from OR Books. Timothy Naftali is a clinical associate professor of history in public service at NYU and a CNN presidential historian. Tim writes on national security issues, intelligence policy, international history, and presidential history. Using Soviet-era documents, he and Russian academic Alexander Fresenko wrote the prize-winning One Hell of a Gamble, Khrushchev, Castro, and Kennedy, 1958 to 1964, and Khrushchev's Cold War, the latter winning the Duke of Westminster's Medal for Mil uh, Military Literature in 2007. Naftali came to NYU after serving as the founding director of the federal Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum in Yorba Linda, California, where he authored the library's nationally acclaimed exhibit on Watergate, oversaw the release of 1.3 million pages of presidential documents, and released nearly 700 hours of Nixon tapes. It's also where I met Tim. He was my boss for approximately two years. <laughs> Suzanne Nossel currently serves as the executive director of PEN America, the leading human rights and free expression organization. Since joining PEN America in 2013, Suzanne has overseen a doubling of the organization's staff and budget, the establishment of a Washington office, and groundbreaking work on free expression in Hong Kong and China, uh, Myanmar, Eurasia, and the United States. Her prior career has spanned government service and leadership roles in the corporate and nonprofit sectors. She has served as the chief operating officer of Human Rights Watch and as executive director of Amnesty International USA. During the first term of the Obama administration, Nossel served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Organizations, where she led U.S. engagement in the United Nations and multilateral institutions on human rights and humanitarian issues. During the Clinton administration, Nossel was Deputy to the U.S. Ambassador for U.N. Management and Reform at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations, where she was the lead negotiator in settling uh, U.S. arrears to the world, world body. Nossel is a feature columnist for Foreign Policy Magazine and has published op-eds in New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, amongst many other places. Last but not least, Stephen F. Cohen is Professor Emeritus of Politics and Russian Studies at Princeton University and Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies and History at New York University. The recipient of two Guggenheim Fellowships and other awards, Cohen is author of a number of widely acclaimed books, including Bukharin and the Bolshevik Revolution, a political biography, Rethinking the Soviet Experience, Failed Crusade, America and the Tragedy of Post-Communist Russia, The Victim's Return, Survivors of the Gulag after Stalin, and most recently, Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives, From Stalinism to the New Cold War. His new book, Why the Cold War, uh, Why the Cold War Again, will be published in 2018. A contributing editor to The Nation magazine, Cohen's articles have also appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, and other American and international publications. Victor, I turn the panel to you. Sure. We're going to have opening remarks from each of the panelists, then a discussion, and then we'll throw it to Q&A for the last 30 minutes or so. Thank you very much, and welcome to all of you. And uh, I have to say, I'm going to just say a few words. We have a great panel for you, 
I'm interested in what they have to say, and at the faces I recognize in this audience, you all could be up here. I see Katrina Vanden Heuvel, I see Bob Shear, I see Tony Hiss, I see a lot of people, I see Jeff Kisloff, who know a lot more than most people do about the subject that we're talking about this weekend, so it's an honor to be here. Um, I would just say a few words about McCarthyism and its relevance to today. Uh, one of them is that if, if, you know, I came to the subject writing about the Hollywood blacklist, but I had an interest in it long before that. I'm going to jump to one of tomorrow's panels to explain my interest. I uh, had been brought up in New York City, went to the Little Red Schoolhouse where our director was subpoenaed to appear before one of the investigating committees of the McCarthy period, so you sort of couldn't escape it. And uh, when I came to The Nation magazine in 1978, it happened to be the same year that a new biography was coming, a new book was coming out about Alger Hiss. And it would, said it was by Alan Weinstein, and the book was advertised in advance as the final nail in Alger Hiss's coffin. I knew Alger Hiss a little bit because I had published and edited a little magazine of political satire called Monocle, as in Monocle, and we called ourselves a leisurely quarterly of political satire, uh, which meant we came out twice a year. <laughs> and we would have people in the neighborhood over. And one of the people who was in the neighborhood was Alger Hiss, who was then selling stationery. He had been to prison, and he was out, and we invited him to lunch. He seemed like a nice, quiet gentleman, <laughs> to speak what was said before and very affable and unthreatening. And of course, in the McCarthy years, the, the, the first thing about those years were, I would say, if you had to list the number one theme of those years, it was that communism represented, and the communism in general, Marxism, Leninism, and the former Soviet Union, and which was not former then, the Soviet Union and Russia represented this uh, terrible threat to everything that America stood for and that it was best ab about uh, the United States. So terrible that uh, Hiss was accused of uh, stealing secrets and was convicted of perjury. So we had him over. The Alan Weinstein book came out and I read it, and I asked the nation's then editor, Blair Clark, who was there before I got there, if, if I could get a copy of that, and he had the literary editor send me a copy. And I read the book, and I said to myself, if Alan Weinstein is right, I have to rethink my impression of Alger Hiss as a nice, quiet gentleman. It seemed to me that he was much more threatening than that that he had to be guilty, and uh, if everything Weinstein said was true. So I took the galleys that I had, and there were, a, a, there were six or seven key people, and I sent to each of these people who he had interviewed, and I was not a student of the case or a scholar of the case, I sent to each of them the pages dealing with them and quoting from them, and asked them whether they were accurately represented based on my, again, growing curiosity about Alger and about the case. And I got an answer from six of them, not the seventh. And all six said essentially the same thing. They said, yes, it is accurate, that is exactly what I said, but he makes it sound like I was confirming espionage, and as far as I knew, there was no espionage. So to me, that was an education about the difference between the uh, images and the stereotypes of those years and the reality of what was going on. So I ended up writing about the book and the case. And, uh, and as you all know, and we'll learn more tomorrow, it is still with us. And, and by the way, I should say, there is a group of people who are trying to bring a quorum nobis petition 
to reopen it. And uh, if any of you are interested, you could talk to me or Tony Hiss, and I could put you in touch with uh, how, to, how to be helpful on that. So number one was this image in the McCarthy years of the former Soviet Union, the Communist Party, as, as the ultimate evil threat that surrounds us all. The second thing I would say was characteristic of the McCarthy years was the consequent betrayal of the ideals and in some cases close personal friends that characterized our democratic society that in response to the threat, the so-called threat of communism, Leninism, Stalinism, and the former Soviet Union, and the exploitation of it by McCarthy and company, which was not just McCarthy, it was the Un-American Activities Committee, it was the Subversive Activities Control Board, it was a whole set of institutions that went along with it. The third thing I would say that was characteristic of those years was the institutionalization of anti-democratic institutions by way of combating the so-called red menace. And that's what the blacklist was, was the institutionalization of how do you fight the red menace by not hiring people in television and, and in the movies and in many other organizations in American life that was taken up by the American Legion as well as many other groups that were known for their patriotism. And the fourth thing I would say was characteristic of the McCarthy period that is relevant to this conference. Tomorrow was beyond the creation of the, and the exploitation of the great fear, the um, institutionalization of it in the anti-communist apparatus, uh, and the be betrayal of friends and ideals. The fourth thing that I would say was characteristic of it was it took our eye off the ball that it basically made it inconvenient, unpopular, and politically um, damaging to think of diplomacy and peaceful solutions to the world's problems. The suggestion was if you were a serious anti-communist, the way to fight communism was with, to meet its potential military force with our own military force. So I think in each of these areas that there is a contemporary equivalent, although there, and that uh, we start, and I'm sure it's gonna come up in the panel later, uh, that R Russia, there is no more Soviet Union, there is Russia. But I would argue and that the, our image of Russia and what it's doing and hacking, they may well have hacked what they're accused of having hacked in this country, but the image of it and why it's dangerous is a carryover from the old Cold War to me and the, the uh, exploitation of it and the exaggeration of its consequences are totally uh, understandable in view of what came before in the Cold War years. I would also suggest that the uh, polarization between the parties and within the Republican Party is not the equivalent of the informing that took place in the, in the old uh, McCarthy days, but the ability to work with each other and to address the problems that confront us are impaired in the same way they were during those years. I th and I would say also that while there is no institutionalized equivalent of the blacklist, not yet anyway, the uh, Trump's base harbors stereotypes of the liberal left and that are, that demonize uh, whole groups of people, religions and others that make social progress difficult if not impossible. And, f and fourth and finally in the contemporary world I would say that when it comes to things uh, like North Korea's waving around their nuclear weapons and uh, which in this totally irresponsible and difficult to understand way 
We live in this age where nuclear weapons are rattling around and you have terrorists like ISIS out there, that the rational way to deal with those things is through attempts at peace and diplomacy, peace through diplomacy, rather than threatening force, which is a heritage from the McCarthy years. So with that as background, I want to um, invite the panelists to have their say one at a time. They, they're free to sit there and use the microphone in front of them or to come up here because I'm going to sit down and watch what, and listen to what you have to say. And I'm going to start with Sarah Jaffe and then I'm going to go to Susan Nussel and then to Tim and then to Steve Cohen. And uh, so, okay, thank you. Am I on though? I'm on, great, hello. Thank you all for having me. Um, I have a much less impressive resume than everybody else on this stage. And so um, to live up to that, I'm gonna talk about Twitter. Um, <laughs> so this one's for Katrina. Um, so I am a journalist. Um, I cover labor and social movements. Um, and I am a freelancer, which means that I sort of am required by the sort of rules of the market these days to be, as the kids say, extremely online. That means I have a Twitter, I have a public facing Facebook page, as well as my personal Facebook. Um, I have Instagram, um, I have a few others, but those are basically the things that are somewhat connected to my work and my public persona. So that means that in addition to tweeting links to my own articles, I make comments on various things on, that are going on in the world. Um, so this week, I forget which day it was actually, um, I tweeted something in response to this ongoing um, looting hype around the hurricanes in Florida and, and Texas. Um, we've seen a lot of sort of police departments saying that they are going to check warrants at the shelters, things like that. So I comment, I tweeted something about, and I don't even remember the exact wording of this thing, um, that I do remember that I used the word carceral state because apparently this made a lot of people look that up. Um, but somehow this crossed the path of somebody at, I guess, first Fox News who wrote an article about it, um, about how there was this Twitter backlash about this person who said this thing and they have to sort of make me sound much more important than I am to even justify writing an article at Fox News about my tweet because I'm not the president. Um, I'm just a person who wrote a book. But Fox News is like, prestigious author Sarah Jaffe says that the carceral state is linked to white supremacy. And I'm like, guys, ask Michelle Alexander how many books she's sold with that exact argument. I didn't realize this was that controversial. But what happens in your social media if you become um, the object of the two minutes hate for this week is that you are flooded. And this is, this is happening, I'm getting emails through the contact thing on my personal website, my Facebook page is full of comments, ranging, ranging from like sort of normal, like how dare you say this, to really racist things that I'm not going to repeat here. Um, my Twitter feed is filled with this. I have learned very many things this week about which social media are easy to deal with influx of hate mail and which ones are harder. Um, Twitter is good at this at this point, or at least you can sort of mute it. Um, and the thing is, this happens to a lot of people, right? It's also happening on a much grander scale right now to ESPN reporter um, Jamila Hill, who said that Donald Trump was a white supremacist and Donald Trump's press secretary at his press conference said that she should be fired. Um, it's happened to a lot of um, left-leaning professors in the last couple of years. Um, my friend George Chikarello Mar has been targeted for this, um, where an offhand tweet that you send thinking about for 30 seconds suddenly becomes the demand for your job. And so um, this is one way that they're attempting to revive the blacklist. It's the social media blacklist. Now, they're gonna figure out eventually that most of the people who hire me know what my political opinions are and are not particularly worried about it. Um, the good folks at the Nation Institute are aware of what I think. Um, but this is, you know, this has cost a couple of professors their jobs in the last year or so. Um, it's certainly a problem for people who are adjuncts and we can talk about the increasing precarious labor in the university for approximately ever. But I think this is important to understand the way that these things happen now. Um, and so that's the first thing I wanted to start with. The other Twitter story um, is one that's in my book actually. And so for 
a few years Anyway, it stopped tweeting sometime in 2015. There was this automated Twitter bot called the Red Scare Bot. And if you said anything about socialism, communism, or there were a couple of other keywords, um, it would tweet some sort of nonsense words at you, like hot to Trotsky or something like that. Um, and I, I got obsessed with this thing, partly because it tweeted at me a lot for my you know, choice in t subject matter, but also because like, it finally sort of made McCarthy into a joke. And now looking at this sort of post-Cold uh, War generation of the young left, where you're seeing things like the Democratic Socialists of America having a major spike in membership. They're now at nearly 30,000 members. I'm sure probably some people in here are DSA members. Um, the popularity of Bernie Sanders with young people. And the sort of the reactions that I see from younger folks are just kind of like, they can't imagine that it was impossible to call yourself a socialist and remain employed for a period of time in this country. Um, and so we're, we have these two things right now, right? That the, the blacklisting tendency is a little more flexible. They can't really get you fired as easily for saying you're a socialist. Now, you know, we had a guy run for president who did that. But if you say something that is determined to be somehow out of the, the norm and they pounce on it, even if it's something that, again, like can be backed up with a lot of facts, it doesn't really matter. And we've seen this this week also with um, Harvard University deciding after um, offering Chelsea Manning to be a, a visiting fellow, rescinding that. And the other one, and I'm going to apologize for not having just remembered this woman's name again, um, the woman who was offered a, fe or a graduate, I think, believe stipend for the entire program at, at Harvard and then was denied it. And this, in the statement of doing this, she was a, a former, um, formerly incarcerated. And in the statement, they admitted that they rescinded her offer because they didn't want to give $200,000 worth of funding to somebody and then have Fox News say, oh, look at what liberal Harvard is doing. And so, you know, we've got, we've got a space where you can be, you can publicly declare yourself a socialist. You can have a successful socialist magazine. The New Republic paid me to write an article where I talked about socialism that came out today. But at the same time, people are really trying to revive this blacklist apparatus and using 21st century media in order to do that. And so I'm going to stop there and hand this off, and there are plenty of other stop? things we you can sure talk you about. you want to stop there? Okay. Well, I mean, okay. we got plenty of things to talk Good. about, I'm sure, we Victor. Do, but I want to <laughs> just ask you one question, and then All right. go to see us. It's true that, you're, that Bernie Saunders could say he was a socialist and you're allowed to say you're a socialist today. Saunders never talks about his being Jewish unless it comes, but he doesn't deny it if it comes up. Yeah. What does that mean? What does that tell us, if anything? I mean, I can tell you what a lot of the hate comments that I got in the last week were commenting about me. Um, you know, I, sure. I can absolutely tell you that these things are linked, and I mean, we... Um, I think that that's a whole other set of uh, things to dive into here that I don't, you know, all of this, the revival of blacklisting, the revival of all of that is, you know, deeply connected to this xenophobic trend that, that Trump is escalating. Um, the, you know, when you think about the folks who are marching in Charlottesville, they're, you know, they're saying Jew will not replace us. They're not saying you. Um, and so, we can talk probably Good. a lot more about the connections between anti-Semitism and, and uh, McCarthyism, but... Okay. Good. Susan Nussel? Mm. Susan asked gonna, me to go. I'll, I'll go next. Are and we I'll, calling you next? I was going to call Susan next, but I, I feel free. Next, so I'm sticking to that story. <laughs> feel free. Uh, thanks. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about nativism and... Um, uh, and uh, because I think one of the challenges for a historian is to try to figure out if something is new. And uh, um, I saw Stephen Schlesinger in the audience and his father thought deeply about cycles of history. And uh, uh, in the uh, foreword to Richard Rovere's book on McCarthyism, Arthur Schlesinger talked about these moments of irrationality in American history. and. And so I, um, I thought it might be interesting just to, to, to hear, if I may, uh, read from this letter that a pollster wrote 
um, about a public official. My own guess is that this public official, who at that point had reached 34% uh, in public approval, has probably reached the bottom of his decline. The people who have not been won to date probably cannot be won by any known tactic, even if it were known that this official had killed five innocent children, they would probably still go along with him. Uh, that was George Gallup writing about um, McCarthy in 1954 after the Army McCarthy hearings. And McCarthy's public approval never got below 30% while he was alive. Um, if, if you look at uh, our country's history, you will notice these uh, very difficult, challenging periods of xenophobia or nativism. Um, one of the challenges for historians and, and analysts is to try to parse out the role of culture and the role of, of economics. Uh, there are times when it's the result of a depression that leads to the xenophobia and nativism. There are times when immigration, a large group of immigrants come into the country and, and, and send the country off in this direction. The famous Know Nothing Party, one of my favorite names for a party. It could be used in so many periods of history. It's just not all the parties take that name. The Know Nothing Party is a product in large measure of the immigration that comes to this country after the revolutions in Europe in 1848. And for, for most of the Know Nothings, much of this was an anti-Catholic um, sentiment. In fact, some of the first efforts at prohibition in this country are a product, our reaction to the immigration, the German immigration of the 1840s and 50s. And what the Know Nothings wanted to do was they wanted to make it harder to become a US citizen. They wanted you to have to be resident in the country for 21 years before you could be naturalized as a citizen. Plus, you were not allowed to even start the process of naturalization if you were considered a pauper, if you were poor. Well, the next time we have this great sense of nativism, we, we actually call it the progressive era, and that com comes out as, after the wave of Eastern European immigration and some Italian immigration in the late 19th century. And there are enormous efforts to restrict immigration, which actually go nowhere until an anarchist kills the President of the United States in 1901, and then we have a very restrictive immigration policy, the beginning of what would become very, very restrictive by the 1920s, which of course is a result of another wave of immigration. Now, what's really dis disturbing is if you look at public opinion polls, and you know, the polls were, we can all quibble about polls now. Is it, we can quibble about polls now. But public opinion polls in the 30s were really in their infancy. Nevertheless, Public opinion polls in the, in the late 1930s showed that the American people were against increased Jewish emigration from Europe. In fact, America, a 41% of Americans believed that Jews were too powerful in this country in 1938. 20% of those polled in 1938 wanted Jews to be expelled from the United States. After World War II, in 1946, 72% of those polled said that we should not be admitting more displaced people from Europe, despite the fact there were 11 million displaced people in camps in Europe. How much of the McCarthy period is a product of that nativism, and how much of it is a product of, of the New Deal and a reaction to the progressive policies, domestic, not foreign, of the United States government? That's very hard to parse out. But it's very useful to us in trying to figure out today to try to understand why we have had a return of nativism. In, in 2015, an IPSAS poll showed that 72% um, of, uh, of Republicans said, I do not recognize the United States anymore. Um, and 53% of independents agreed. We are living through another wave of nativism. 
When you combine that with the consequences of the Great Recession, the economic consequences, it is no surprise that we are going through such a period of psychic trauma. So as we try to assess the role of Trump, the individual, we should not lose sight of the fact that our country is yet again going through a moment of social turmoil. Our challenge as analysts and historians is try to figure out why, and then, those who care about making this a better country, how to deal with it. But I think it's really important. It's easy to focus on the man, and I'm happy to do that in the Q&A, but I also think this is a moment of crisis, of social tumult, tumult, and it's not new in our history, and we have to think of it that way. Could you, that's very helpful, very important. Thank you. The one thing you didn't mention, among the many other things you didn't, and we'll get to that in the Q&A, was you were charged with and famously put together the whole Nixon Library and Archive. And I'm curious, when you talk about Trump, is there anything to be learned about what you learned? Uh, well, Victor, Victor, we could have an entire, know, we could have an entire seminar going, on but that. Nevertheless. Long, long, long story short, I've written, I've written about it, but long story short is that, um, so, and I'm not a psychologist and I do not play one on television, um, but I do think, it's, I think people who, people who have passed away and who created tapes are fair game. Um, Richard Nixon was psychologically insecure and unstable. And people, As distinguished from our current I'm president. Gonna, I do not, I have not, I, right. Mr. Mr. Feelgood, his doctor, has told us that he's mentally okay. Right. Um, but um, I think the tweets indicate an instability. I'm not new, no, but I'm not telling you anything you don't know. And my concern about that kind of person in the presidency is that if they are not surrounded with strong people, and Nixon had strong people, but they were flawed and couldn't stop all of the bad things he wanted to do. If, you're not, if they're not surrounded with strong people, then the insecurity could lead to very serious abuses of power. And on the foreign, God knows what could happen on the, on, on the foreign level. What might surprise all of you is that, for my money, the more unstable member of the national security team in the Nixon period was Kissinger, not Nixon, but that's a different story. Thank you very much. Great. Susan? So I'm not a historian. I run a free expression organization, and I'll uh, try to answer this question through that lens and first uh, talk about a few parallels that I do see in the current climate uh, when, uh, and, and in looking back to the McCarthy era, and then some, some parallels that have been drawn that I really don't see. Um, you know, the first really builds on Tim's uh, argument about nativism, and I think it's, it's, it's an extension of that. It's, it's demagoguery. And I think you could draw a, a direct line between uh, Trump and McCarthy that kind of runs right through Roy Cohn, Trump's uh, lawyer early in his career. Uh, they first met when he was fighting a discrimination suit uh, brought against uh, the, the operations of a housing development, and he hired Roy Cohn, who developed a very aggressive legal strategy. They were going to fight back, and I think. It, you know, they, the two men uh, built a close relationship. And I think if you look at Trump's approach, you know, there's a, there's a kind of famous quote from Roy Cohn uh, about handling the media. Uh, talk, he was talking to the investigative journalist Wayne Barrett and said, you've written 34 stories about me and you've never written a good word, Cohn said one day. You have no idea how much money you've made for me. And I think that was, you know, for Trump, a kind of touchstone of this dysfunctional symbiosis with the media, an obsession with coverage, with image building, uh, with the power to make headlines, and a, a very self-serving, uh, avaricious approach to public life that has fueled his presidency and his designs on national power. And, you know, I think for McCarthy as well, uh, this incredibly uh, self-interested, you know, some may say narcissistic personality, I'm not a psychiatrist uh, or a psychologist, I, I, I can't claim to make that kind of analysis, but I think there definitely are 
parallels in the kind of power that these men sought and wielded over our discourse and the suspension of disbelief among many Americans in hearing out their claims, uh, buying into their arguments, despite an absence of evidence, despite evidence to the contrary, and you know, almost a, a, a kind of bamboozling effect that they've had in our discourse. Second thing I would draw attention to, which Victor and others have touched on, is, is the climate of fear and victimization uh, that I think we, we've witnessed in both eras, but you know, taking different forms. Fear uh, of communists in our midst, of disloyalty, you know, in this era, fears of racial vulnerability, uh, of marginalization, uh, of uh, being left behind. And, you know, in, in our current era, a kind of boomeranging set of fears, fears among, uh, you know, white people from around the country uh, who support Trump, that they are somehow being left behind by an America that they no longer know. And then a corresponding fear uh, that results from the Trump, the Trump campaign's rhetoric and the Trump administration's policies targeting immigrants, Muslim Americans, uh, their indifference to issues of uh, racial victimization that has led whole groups of Americans to feel that they're targeted, they're victimized, they're, vul they're newly vulnerable. Third thing I'd point to is self-censorship and the, the notion in both eras that certain ideas are off limits and too dangerous to be taken, to, to be talked about and effectively kind of off the table for uh, public discussion, even private discussion. You know, during the McCarthy era, certain, you know, uh, admitting you'd read a socialist newspaper or magazine could be grounds for a conviction or for losing your job. Now we see this both on the left and the right, uh, you know, and, and Sarah gave one example from her own personal life, but uh, this is happening left and right to academics, professors, journalists who make a controversial comment, uh, a tweet, they, you know, they become targeted, that whether it's the right-wing press or the left-wing press uh, that goes after them and there's kind of signaling that happens on social media, uh, a mob effect, and you know, many people conclude they're just uh, a whole host of topics that are too hot to touch, too likely to make you a target of this kind of public opprobrium. You know, now the opprobrium, you know, sort of lives forever online. And so these comments stay with you, the criticisms they trigger stay with you, and it can be easier simply to be silent. And so, uh, you know, my concern there is that whole topics are being effectively taken off the table in our public discourse. Third point I make uh, is around kind of private enforcement and the mobilization of private entities, you know, whether it was the Hollywood backlist or all kinds of professionals that lost work during the McCarthy era, or now uh, universities, news and media organizations imposing punishments for speech for fear that if they don't take action, you know, not just the speaker, but they too institutionally are going to be held to blame, are going to be blacklisted, are going to be rejected by consumers, are going to be targeted with the ire of the administration. So the private actors that have become de facto enforcers of these prohibitions on speech. And then the last I'll point to is uh, around loyalty oaths and the notion in the McCarthy era that, you know, he, he began with a list of uh, state supposed communist sympathizers in the State Department. You know, now there's this climate of targeting of, you know, what the, the euphemisms are, Obama administration holdovers, uh, representatives of the deep state who are accused of disloyalty. They have lists of some of these individuals that have been published. There are people in the Foreign Service and the Civil Service that really believe their career prospects effectively have been ruined because they are associated with certain Obama-era policies, so they don't believe they'll ever be considered for promotion, and they're looking, you know, many of them have left uh, those institutions like the State Department, others are looking to leave because they fear, you know, effectively their perceived political leanings uh, are career enders. And then finally, just to touch on where I think we may, the conversation may go next, which is whether the sort of Russia-related fears are an echo of the McCarthy era, and you know, obviously, our relationship with R Russia exists on a chronological continuum. And, you know, people do remember the Cold War. They remember the Soviet era. Uh, you know, they know of Putin's background uh, in the KGB. And so, you know, you, you, there are linkages between what we see today and uh, that historical memory. At the same time, in terms of the concerns that are fueling 
the investigations that are now underway, the revelations that we've learned of even just over the last 10 days in terms of you know, the depths of Russia's role in the 2016 election, what they were doing on Facebook, mobilizing whole groups called things like Texas Heartland uh, that had more followers than the Texas, the Republican Party of Texas, uh, drawing people to immig anti-immigration rallies, playing on the most divisive and polarizing social issues in our domestic context. You know, those, those things are really new. Uh, you know, I don't think this wasn't happening during the McCarthy era. And I think they're very justifiable and important uh, issues to investigate, probe, understand, and be concerned about. I think the individuals who are at the heart of these probes, uh, someone like Bob Mueller, I mean, these are not people who've made their career, you know, who are out to make a career uh, out, uh, f from Russia baiting and Russia hating. You know, I think they come to it honestly. They have genuine concerns that they're trying to get the bottom, to the bottom of. And, and, you know, not until those investigations are completed will we have a full understanding. But I don't think this is anything like uh, the kind of probes that uh, Joseph McCarthy initiated. I don't think the rationale is the same. I don't think the factual basis is the same. And I don't think the outcome will be the same. Thank you, Susan. And well, Steve, just before you start, Steve, let me ask Susan one question. And that is, when I was on the board of Penn, there were big arguments within the board. Uh, for example, Norman Mailer invited the Secretary of State yeah. to address Penn over something, and E.L. Dr. Rowe criticized him for doing that. I would think with what's happening on campuses today that there would be arguments within Penn about what's going on in terms of free speech, since Penn is one of the leading First Amendment and human rights organizations in the world. Could you t any anything to say about that? Yeah, we've done a lot of work on issues of campus speech. We put out a big report last fall called And Campus for All, Diversity, Inclusion, and Free Speech at U.S. Universities. And we're now going around the country. We're doing a series of convenings at the end of next month. We'll be uh, at Berkeley, and then we'll be at Middlebury in January. And so we're very seized with these issues. I stayed up last night to watch Ben Shapiro's talk at Berkeley. Um, you know, in terms of divisions within Penn, you know, there are. And I think there are legitimate disagreements about some of these very tough issues. I mean, you could say Milo Yiannopoulos should be allowed to speak, and we do say that. We defend his right to speak. You know, when he... Uh, you know, th threatens to name names of students who uh, are undocumented and who may face deportation, and you know the consequences for them, you know, could be so immediate. You know, we we need to think about how our you know constructions of free speech sort of deal with that. You know, we have a very narrow definition of incitement in this country that uh, you know would certainly that certainly wouldn't qualify. And yet, I think a lot of us intuitively feel like. Wow, you know, that maybe does cross some kind of line. It doesn't cross a legal line, uh, you know, but are there, you know, I think it unquestionably crosses a moral line, um, you know, but is it, is it the role of the university to stand in the way of that? Is, the role, is, it, is it the role of an organization like us to? So they're tough questions, and we can get into that more in the Q&A if people are interested. Thank you. So Steve Cohen, to you. What? <laughs> it's your show now, and then I after you be. speak, I'm going to have questions for you, well, as will everybody else. So. Well, you know what they say, or they used to say in Russia, a uh, good new question is a lot better than the usual answers. Okay. Can you do that? Oh, no. We'll see. Now, I probably shouldn't be on this panel. Um, I haven't studied McCarthyism. I haven't professionally engaged with McCarthyism in any organization. Uh, what I know about McCarthyism in a formal way, I learned from the person who would later be my wife, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, who's here, because when we met, she was doing scholarly study of McCarthyism, and she even worked on a documentary film about it. And then, of course, as the editor of The Nation, it comes with the franchise. And, of course, I learned a lot from Victor Navasky. Uh, in his writings. But I don't have a uh, special expertise. Uh, being one of the older people in the room, actually I was one of Vic's teachers at the Little Red Schoolhouse, and we're all proud of how he turned out. Um, 
I lived through the original McCarthy era as a boy and a teenager. But I grew up in the Jim Crow South in Kentucky, and the white folk were way too busy making sure the black folk didn't cross any white lines to worry a whole lot about communists. Though we were assigned as mandatory reading in high school to some book by J. Edgar Hoover, I forget which one, on communism, I think. Uh, my problem is also is that I lived for a very long time in Soviet Russia, uh, Brezhnev's Soviet Russia. Katrina was with me during a lot of that time. I don't know if you've ever discussed this, but we lived among uh, Soviet dissidents and victims of the Stalin era. Uh, I wrote a book about it, The Victim's Return. It's kind of a personal book because I knew these people and I am mindful as an American that no matter how bad things get or got here, it was a lot worse there. Uh, and yet, I think and I think today that the political courage there was considerably higher than it is here in my own country. On the other hand, I understand that victimization and injustice and persecution uh, you have to deal with in your own country because we're patriots of justice in our own country first and foremost. Uh, on the other hand, and this is what I will talk about in not very long, I have spent nearly 50 years uh, in the academic field of Russian studies, which if you think about it is kind of ground zero, kind of the key west uh, when storms of McCarthyism hit America. It always hits Russian studies. Uh, as a result, I've had some close encounters with the legacies of McCarthyism over the years, and I'm just going to rattle them off, and you make of them what you will. When I came to Columbia University from Kentucky and Indiana in the early 60s, I was absolutely flabbergasted that there were at the university uh, three or four professors in my field who had been badly bruised by McCarthy personally. He'd named them. My own advisor, John Hazard, who had been deputy director of Lend-Lease was in real danger until he was saved by one General Leslie Groves, uh, a story that should be written up by somebody. These professors, and I respected some more than, the, uh, than others, but these respect, uh, professors warned us, my generation, of emerging Russia specialists in two words, be careful. That was exactly what they said, be careful. Uh, some of us took that deeply to heart. In fact, I think most of us did. A few didn't. Uh, I think this consideration played some role in hiring and promotion decisions at universities where I was. You are not always sure because a lot of this was done while excluding the junior faculty from the uh, deliberations and behind closed doors, but even when I was a member of the senior faculty, some of my colleagues spoke in an Aesopian way that I thought was McCarthyist, but I, they were older and I didn't bother about it too much. Then in the 70s and 80s, there was a deep divide in the field of Russian studies, Soviet studies, um, and there emerged what was called a revisionist school, of which I was one of the two or three leading members. And what we revisionists were doing was reinterpreting Soviet history based on new generational perspectives and new material in ways that suggested that the Soviet system of the late 70s and early 80s, unlike the view, the majority view in our field, did have the capacity to reform itself. And when we made this argument in print or at scholarly conferences, sometimes we were said to be pro-Soviet, because we were arguing that the system might reform itself. But in truth, the people who made these slurs were the dimmest of our opponents, so we pretty much ignored them. And then Gorbachev came and more or less vindicated the historical analysis we had been doing for about 15 years, as the system entered into what was uh, a reformation from within. Uh, With the end of the Soviet Union in 1991, things became somewhat quieter in Russian studies. 
Well, actually, not entirely. Uh, there were two of us of academic status who fiercely opposed America's deep intervention into post-Soviet Russia under Yeltsin during the Clinton years, thinking it very unwise, not to say unseemly, and warning that there would be a backlash. Of course, the backlash came and its name was Putin, but that's a separate story. But for arguing that the United States should not do this, some very influential people in Washington whispered that we were pro-communist and nostalgic for the Soviet Union. So that the argument we were making against the Clinton administration would be discredited. But again, I thought these people had no credibility. They really weren't informed about Russia. They didn't have any knowledge. So I just figured no point giving them any credibility and we remained silent. Well, I did write a book about it called Failed Crusades, Crusade. But the real change comes, as you all know, in 2014 with the Ukrainian crisis and the full bloom of the new Cold War by any name. So in early 2014, and now this becomes about me for a minute, uh, I, feeling at my obligation, being most of my fellow folk down in Kentucky became deputy sheriffs, coal miners, and things like that, whereas I had a pretty easy profession. I just thought it was my obligation to go forward the best I can and explain Russia's side of the Ukrainian crisis story, and yes, Putin's side. And I did this in The Nation in four articles, and because I was still permitted on mainstream television on television. And what ensued was a tsunami of denunciations of me. I'd say the majority of them in so-called liberal media. Uh, the gist of which was I was Putin's number one American friend, apologist, useful idiot, and my favorite, which appeared in the New Republic, Tony. I'm still not sure what that means, but I knew it wasn't good. Um, there were implications that I was being paid and all the rest. This didn't surprise me, but it shocked me because of the extent of it. I have two Xerox cartons full of these articles that I printed out and threw in in case one day I might want to write about it. Uh, looking back, these charges of collusion, essentially, with Putin, Looking back, because Trump was nowhere on the scene at this time, makes me think that I was a dry run for Trump. Because when I look at the language and the innuendos and the suggested implications, it's not dissimilar. I'll give you one example. There's a man named William Browder. I don't know if you know who he is, but he gave us the Magnitsky Act based on a false tale he told about what happened in Moscow to his company and to his CPA. And Browder tweeted that the first person the FBI should investigate is Stephen Cohen. Now Browder's a powerful man. He privatized legislation in our Congress. He's a billionaire. He's on every major network weekly. Um, so. This was getting out of hand, but I didn't think much about it until things got bigger. They forgot about me and they went on to other things. And then in late 2014 and early 2015, uh, my wife and I were blindsided by what I think was really an act of McCarthyism in my own scholarly profession. We have the, it's the association that unites people who study Russia and other Slavic countries. Uh, my wife has a small found family foundation. Uh, the association was desperately in need of graduate fellowships for people who needed to travel to Russia to do research in the archives to complete their dissertation. The field is thinning out. We need a successor generation of professors. So uh, Katrina, through her foundation, offered a, not, a, a modest but not inconsiderable amount of money to the association for these fellowships, six a year, that will be to name the Cohen Tucker Fellowship, honoring me and my beloved mentor, the late Robert C. Tucker. 
And for about six months, it was great. I mean, all the financial officers and executive officers negotiated. We signed the agreement. Katrina did. And then the board met and voted that they would accept the money only if my name was removed from the fellowships. Because what I had been saying in the mass media uh, in uh, 214 and 215 was disgraceful and abetting Putin and the rest. Uh, this got out, leaked out, and you can actually look it up. It's on the website of the profession. All the documents are still there. The New York Times wrote it up. Uh, it got the interest of the American um, Association of, U of University Professors, I think it's called. It became, in our teapot, a pretty big scandal. There was a spontaneous, or semi-organized, protest movement from below, uh, a petition protesting the board's decision. I think about 170 people signed it. Uh, the association and the board, now cornered, opened up its website so everybody can write in and say what they think. It wasn't pleasant. But in the end, the board was compelled to change its decision. And the fellowships were enacted. They, they've been given for two years now, six a year. We won, but this episode sent a chill through the field of Russian studies that reminds me of the aftermath that I sensed as a bumpkin from Kentucky. People always said, oh, you're wearing shoes. Um, in New York at Columbia. And I do think it's happening again, at least in my own field. The chill is there, particularly among graduate students and young professors who don't feel as comfortable saying what they might think as they would have had, had before. So here we are, and I'll kind of wrap up now. Two years later, with something called Russiagate, uh, at the center of our national politics. I could not disagree more. Well, set 95% disagree with what Suzanne said, but what she says is what everybody says in the mainstream. So I'll put it like this. Here's what I see today. Through the experience and prism of my own specialization for nearly 40 years of Russian-American relations, I see multiple official investigations of something called collusion with the Kremlin, which, as these investigations fail to turn up any credible evidence, grow wider and deeper and more promiscuous in a kind of frantic attempt to justify their existence, slurring ever more reputations along the way. And when this vanishes, and if it's proven to have been nothing, the reputations will remain slurred, as they did after McCarthy became discredited. There must have been something there, smoke and fire, all that. Second, I see, and I was a member of the mainstream American media, partly thanks to Vic letting me write a column in The Nation for years, and partly because CBS put my kids through school paying me to be its on-air consultant for nearly 20 years. I was a card-carrying member of the mainstream media. But I see the most influential mainstream media outlets today, let me name them, the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, and MSNBC, zealously promoting this search for collusion by abandoning daily, if not hourly, their own long professed traditions of reliable evidence and balanced coverage. I see a systematic exclusion. I could name names, but I'm not because a lot of people don't want to be named. Systematic exclusion, in effect, a kind of blacklisting of informed alternative opinion, people who don't agree with this narrative but who have ample credentials not to agree with it, being systematically excluded from those op-ed pages, from those, that reporting, and from those panels on television. One by one, they've been deleted. And I see today, as we talk, a growing official and unofficial 
series of campaigns to purge something called Russian disinformation from our media. I mean, millions, tens of millions of dollars have been funded for this purpose. What the German Marshall Fund is up to is disgraceful, but this same stuff has been voted bipartisanly in the Congress. They're going to get rid of Russian disinformation and its carriers in the American media. It does not take a historian of McCarthyism to know where this is leading. And alas, I see new, too many people who certainly know better, who, or who certainly should know better, participating in this reckless political media spectacle, or remaining silent. The silence aggravates me the most including the silence in Congress. Well, I've had senators and congressmen say, Steve, you're right. I say, great, Senator, I look forward to your op-ed piece or your, no, it's, it's difficult, it's complicated. You know, Trump and Bernie and Hillary, and we gotta work on the party. I guess this is reminiscent of McCarthyism. I've always thought that it was a pity to call it McCarthyism because he was an insignificant prick and the phenomenon as Timothy pointed out, might be indigenously American. Maybe, I mean, I'm not down with Richard Hofstadter's book entirely, but maybe we need a different name. Why should we honor McCarthy by perpetuating his name? But I don't know what you call it. So I conclude with this. Here's what I think. I think that Russiagate probably, because I don't say things I can't document, but probably originated among a few top American intelligence officials. Based on what they've said publicly, I would guess they included Brennan, head of the CIA, Clapper, head of defense intelligence, and Comey, head of FBI. And that their, quote, assessments, for which they've never produced any forensic or other evidence, except that there's a Russian TV network in this country called RT that no one watches. It doesn't even make Nielsen's ratings. Cable vision doesn't carry it. Physis or FISO doesn't carry it. Only what used to be called Time Warner carries it in the Northeast. You can't get it on Long Island. I try to watch it every night, one half hour international news because the footage is good and sometimes they tell me about an international story I didn't know about. Um, the intelligence agencies have pumped assessments, uh, dossiers, uh, and leak this stuff to the media, which swallows it whole and puts it on the front page the next day. This, I think, triggered this phenomenon. I think it inflated it, and I think it perpetuates it today. I personally think that this is what must be resisted. This, not Trump's constitutional election of president. He can be defeated in three and a half years, constitutionally. But what needs to be resisted is what's going on here. But there is no resistance, almost none, in the mainstream. Um, otherwise, unless it's resisted, I think there are two grave dangers. I think we're closer to war with Russia than we have ever been, at least since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I think the dangers to American democracy that occurred under McCarthy uh, could very easily happen again, maybe already. So, to paraphrase Pogo, I'm not sure how many people here are old enough to remember Pogo. He was in a cartoon script by Al Cap called Little Abner. Uh, he was a mythically wise and edible figure. Uh, Pogo returned from the wilderness and said, and I paraphrase here, I have seen the enemy. It's not Trump. It's not Putin. It's us. And that's what I see and think today. If that's McCarthyism, I let the professionals uh, say so. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Steve. That's great. I, I'll say um, I'm looking at Katrina Van Den Heuvel, who's sitting in the second row, and don't mean to intrude on you, but if I were sitting in your chair, I would ask Steve to publish that in The Nation. There we are, anyway. So, Instead of, instead of Steve, instead of calling it McCarthyism, the problem is the guy who next 
best represents what McCarthyism stands for is the word cone, so we can call it conism, but that's going to confuse a lot of people. So there we go. Without the E. Okay, that's going to confuse a lot of people. So listen, um, I, I mentioned before, as I look at this audience, there are so many people there who know so much that I want to involve them in this discussion. And uh, I want them to join in. But first, I want to give other panelists a chance to respond to what they've heard on the stage. And uh, as I listen to Steve talking, I ask myself, where are the old organizations? Before we began, I was talking to Bob Shearer about, and he was saying that in the, in the McCarthy era, you had uh, you knew that there were organizations that there was a sharp divide that would stand up for old-fashioned values and that there was a question about what was the situation today. So my, as I hear Steve talking, I ask myself, has the ACLU weighed in on any of this stuff? Has Penn weighed in on any of this stuff? Should they be doing so? That's my question. So. Anyway, but I want to invite the, the other panelists to join in. So, Tim, you're looking like you have something to say. Well, the, f <laughs> the, first, the first thing I want to say um, is there's too much meanness. Too much meanness. Too much meanness right now. Whether it's the way people respond to a tweet that they don't like, or it's to the way they respond to an article in The Nation that they don't like. Um, it's too personal and it's too mean and it's not right. And, I, and I'm not sure whether that is cyclical in American history or whether that's a product of, of social media, but there's a, there's a level of personal nastiness that's really unpleasant and um, I'm sorry to have heard the personal nastiness that, that Stephen suffered. Saying that, I disagree with him. But that's okay. I disagree with him on the case. It's a matter of, you know, I disagree. Um, and I'll tell you very briefly why I disagree. But the first thing I want to make clear is that you can disagree with someone without trying to destroy them. Uh, that's Nixonian. You want to you talk about, you know, words? That's Nixonian you, when you start destroying people. So um, I think that I... I would agree that there's been a rush to judgment, and anybody who says there's collusion, all right, that's, they, 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 they're much too far along in this process. Um, and those of us who study intelligence history, and for my, you know, for, for my sins, I do that too. Uh, if you read a certain national intelligence estimate about Iraq WMD, you would have also seen highly, you would have seen this, some of the same language as was included in the National Intelligence Estimate, though they didn't call that the community assessment of hacking. Nevertheless, I can also show you intelligence history assessments that are where there's high confidence and turned out they were right. Uh, we just have been through the Iraq nonsense and for many people there's an understandably deep suspicion of the intelligence community which some would call the deep state. When I teach conspiracy thinking to my students, I ask them to, to that I pose the question, does this make sense? And I said, uh, if, it, if the explanations get too complicated, you begin to wonder that, you know, maybe, maybe this wasn't a conspiracy after all. My first question is, why would Barack Obama participate in promoting the deep states, if this is correct, the deep states desire for a renewed Cold War. Why would he, why would he do this? Why would he participate in it? Why would he let Brennan do this? Why? Because to make sense of the US government's concern about Russian hacking, leave alone, put, put aside the collusion, which is a different issue, You'd have to propose that the former president of the United States believe the need to restart a Cold War with Russia, to leave that as his legacy. Um, and I, 
I'm, I don't think there's a persuasive argument for that. The next issue, and this also doesn't argue that there was collusion, but the next issue is behavioral patterns. Donald, we don't have any evidence yet, if or there is, may not be. There's no evidence that Donald Trump colluded so far with Russia. But he acted in a way that suggested that he was hiding something. Not so much that he was supporting Putin. It was the way in which he responded to the evidence of Russian involvement, not allowing the possibility that the intelligence community, which he's about to be responsible for, could have been right. And it was the knee-jerk reaction that led many people, including myself, to begin to be very skeptical of him. That was before the evidence came out of all of the meetings. Kisilyov is not that interesting and important. But the meetings between the campaign and Russians that were not reported. Why do you not report meetings if you feel they were completely innocent? That doesn't prove collusion. But it raises the bar and should encourage people to investigate. When I think about this, Stephen, I don't think about McCarthyism. I think about Watergate. And I think about the bar of concern and when is it important for us to have a real serious investigation. I think we have crossed that threshold. I am not saying what's going to come of it, but I think I would be very wary of ascribing a conspiratorial view of Russia behind the need and the desire of many Americans on both parties for a serious investigation of not only Russia's participation or intervention in the election of 2016, but the possibility that they had some American help which might have come from the Trump side. That's how I view it, Stephen. Yeah. Okay, let, let, let me have the other panelists if, answer, make their comment, and then Steve, I'm gonna call on you. And Sarah, I know, had something she oh, wanted yeah, to say, and, and Susan okay. Yeah, okay. as well. Thanks, just because uh, you brought up Pet America. Uh, we have not, uh, as an organization, uh, opined on this, and I don't think it is principally a free expression issue. I think, you know, if people are characterizing something as a, a McCarthy witch hunt, you know, then, and, and, and something that's having chilling effects, I think that, you know, that is a free expression issue. And I think Steve's story implicates many concerns around expression and is, you know, is an alarming account. Uh, and I'm glad you told it. I was aware of some of it, but not of the depths of it. And I can also understand how that would color, you know, your perspective on this. And, and, and yours is colored by, you know, your, your study of Watergate. And I think the truth is, you know, none of us really knows for sure where this is going to end up. You know, I, I do stand by you know, my own account, and I, I think it's a mistake to dismiss this as a kind of McCarthyist witch hunt. I think uh, the concerns are not just around collusion, but also understanding what I think is pretty clearly an influence campaign directed at our election and a, a deliberate effort of a foreign government. And, it, you know, I think it would be the same if it was the Chinese government or the Iranian government. And, you know, no, it's not new. Yes, the U.S. has engaged in its own information campaigns over many years and decades. That's all true. Nonetheless, you know, uh, the, the awareness we have of the sophistication of the tactics, how social media has been used, you know, these are new. And I think, understandably, people want to get to the bottom of it, uh, want to understand how it affects our democracy, how the U.S. can protect itself. So I think that's a legitimate line of inquiry and sort of the suggestion that, you know, it's, it's, it, it's inherently wrong to be worried about these things, to look into them, uh, that that should be shut down, that this is motivated, you know, the motivation must be nefarious. I just don't, I don't buy. I think many people who are concerned about this kind of come from a very genuine place. And, you know, I also think we have a White House and we have many people in Congress who are offering an opposing view and who have very uh, visible podiums from which to do so. So I, I, I believe you that there are people who are being excluded. I'm sure that's true. But there are, you know, it's not as if everybody is on one train on this issue. Um, you know, and I also, you know, when sort of people say this is a, you know, a, a war path, I think it's worth noting that it come, came against the backdrop of 
You know, I think a real, you know, I don't know what you would say, but from my perspective, um, you know, personally having worked in the State Department, I think a very genuine attempt at diplomatic uh, reset and uh, a constructive relationship with Russia over the years of the Obama administration that did not work out. You know, and then just lastly, at Penn, we're definitely, uh, you know, the, this is, it's not an issue that we have weighed in on or would weigh in on. So when I speak about this, it's really from a more of a personal perspective. But we do do a lot of work with Russian dissidents who are, uh, you know, we bring to the United States and we consult with. And, you know, they're extremely alarmed about the climate of repression, uh, artistic repression, intellectual repression in Russia. Uh, you know, they want contacts with the United States. Uh, they want to discuss how we collectively deal with the problems of authoritarianism um, in both of our countries, not to analogize them. But I, I think that perspective needs to be weighed in. And certainly, you know, if you talk about who's the problem, you know, they see Putin as a big part of the problem. Great. Thank you. And Sarah? I know absolutely nothing about Russia and the Russian investigation, so I'm not going to come in at all on that. But I, I do U.S. politics and U.S. social movements. And so the one thing that I do see that has occupied a lot of space since Trump's election is people fixating on Russia as a way to get around thinking about the ways that Trump is not a shocking figure, as Tim was saying, is not new in American history, um, whether we're comparing him to McCarthy or Nixon or any number of other people um, that you can think of. And so I think that, investigate whatever, I don't really have an opinion on that, but I think that we, as people who are political writers, analysts, actors, have to grapple with Trump as he is and not sort of hope that an investigation will make him go away and undo this election. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up, actually, which has nothing to do with Russia, was when Suzanne was talking before, um, you mentioned Milo Yiannopoulos naming names, which, of course, I'm sitting here next to Victor Novasky, whose excellent book on the McCarthy era is called Naming Names, and that brought me back to something none of us have really touched on that much, which is that personal betrayal level of the McCarthy era, um, that kind of thing where people are turning in one another. And so on that level, what Milo is doing is that kind of thing, right? Not just sending his followers to like angrily post insults on my Instagram, but like trying to out people, like dead naming transgender people and naming immigrants with the hopes that by naming those names, there will be material consequences because that's what happened when you were blacklisted. That's what happened when your name was named in the McCarthy era. There were material consequences for people. And so that kind of thing, when we're talking about free speech and we're talking about McCarthyism, we're talking about whatever we want to call it. I talk about the red scare and red baiting. Um, that, like what the speech is doing, I think is really important because the thing that the McCarthy era the naming names taught us is like, these, it's not just speaking, these are speech acts that have real material consequences for people. Thank you very much. Steve, do you want to say something? And then I really want to hear from this audience, but. I mean, I could say a lot, and I don't think it's fair to anybody for me to do so, so just kind of randomly. First of all, frankly, my dear, I didn't give a shit about these attacks on me. I really didn't. I'm the sort of guy that the more they hit me, the writer I think I am, or they wouldn't spend their time hitting me so hard and often. But it had a fallout on people I cared about. My family didn't like it. Uh, my students worried about me. And it did go, once they tried to take me down, it went on to other people because of my age. I was kind of the big cuckoo in the room, and they could, you know, knock me off course. Then, you know, the thing was getting out of hand. But personally, I don't want any sympathy. Some of it was so silly, it was fun. I mean, it's just unbelievable what they write. Also, I'm aware I'm living in a new age. I mean, the internet, social media, which I only see secondarily, just intensifies, speeds, and multiplies these things. So. If one guy back, Tim, in the 50s slurred another, it might take 100 days for it to get to Kentucky, and it might never make the local newspaper. Today, I mean, it, it's completely different. Um, I'm not a conspiracy guy. I'm really not. Uh, I've never really, I mean, I know there are conspiracies, but they don't really interest me very much. I love Oliver Stone's films, and I like Oliver a lot, but 
and I think JFK is just enthralling, but I don't believe a minute of it. But it's fun to watch. I mean, the problem here is, which makes it not a conspiracy but of historical interest, is that Clapper, Brennan, and Comey have said incriminating things since they let off, left office that suggest that they were behind it without saying we were behind it. Uh, and that piqued my attention. And I mean, when Clapper says, first in Australia, then on Meet the Press, that Russians are genetically prone to infiltrate us. Well, he said this. I mean, I don't know what, I mean, but he said it and more than once. I asked myself what you just asked yourself. How could Obama leave him as director of national intelligence? And when Brennan said, literally, Americans should not enter into contacts with Russians because even if they don't want to, they may head down a treasonous path and discover it when it's too late. And of course, Brennan didn't tell me this 50 years ago when I started down this path. Uh, but how Obama could have left him as head of the CIA, which we know, along with the Defense Department, sabotaged Obama's attempt to cooperate with Putin, uh, ensuring intelligence in uh, Syria in 2016. We know, I mean, that's out, that's documented. I too ask myself, what in the world was Obama thinking? And I have an answer, but it's not conspiratorial. It has something to do with Obama. So uh, I would say to Susanna, sure. I mean, Katrina and I probably know a thousandfold more dissidents in Russia uh, than Penn has ever encountered because we've been doing this 30 years. But there's a spectrum of dissidents across. And if you want me to give you some dissidents to, who come here and think that Putin is a pussy and he needs to crack down on everybody and he's betraying Russian national interests, then we can produce their dissidents too. Some of them are in prison for saying these things. So, you know, Every country has its own spectrum of dissidents. We like the dissidents in Russia who sound like us, you know, who, want, you know, who are you know, like liberal or civil society people. But they're, they're the minority, actually, in the provinces in Russia. So we hang out with these people, and certainly Penn should interact with them. But you'd be quite startled to hear what some dissidents from prison have to say about Putin and America and Penn. I mean, they're not liberals, but they are dissidents ferocious ones. So, you know, it's a big elephant. I have absolutely no idea what it means. Everybody says it, that Putin was in the KGB. Zero. Why we think this is a causal factor. So let me confess. Yeah, I have had contacts with uh, Russian intelligence officers of the highest rank, including one five-star general and one three-star general, and one one-star general. I never understood why Putin only made it to colonel, to tell you the truth. No, no, I'm not joking, because these guys weren't not much older. So who were these generals? Well, they were retired, but as they say, there are no retired KGB journals. And they were people who wrote history. And I met them in the archives, in the KGB archives, working on the 1930s. And I knew stuff about the 1930s that they didn't know, and they knew stuff about the 1930s uh, that I didn't know or we didn't know. And they smoked cigarettes, and I smoked cigarettes. And so during our document breaks, we'd go out in the courtyard and kind of say, did you see that document? And what do you think of that? Well, I said, I don't know. You're the KGB general. What's it mean? And they explained to me, well, don't take so. I mean, what's wrong with that? That's good stuff for a historian. A lot of American historians do that. So this business of contacts with Russians, uh, I mean, somebody said, maybe my wife, that a large part of this Russiagate and this financial stuff around Trump is the corruption of the 1% in America and in Russia. That's what it is. And Goldman Sachs was more deeply in Russia financially than any American institution I know of. The first George Bush went there after he left the presidency to open Goldman Sachs' office there. And in 2013, Goldman Sachs was trying to help the Putin government brand Russia as a great place for American investment. So where's it going to stop? I mean, OK, Trump, I mean, I ask myself, every major hotel chain in the world that I know of has built 
a big hotel in Moscow except Trump. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, it just doesn't add up. And the problem here ultimately comes back to something that is McCarthyite. Have all the suspicions you want. You know, think things are puzzling. But there's one thing that my doctor, magazine editors, historians, and journalists have in common. We stand or fall on our factual right. credibility. And if the facts aren't there, we are discredited. And I just don't think the facts are there. Right. And the search for facts is not a just prosecution. Thank you. Now listen, we have microphones on both aisles, and I invite the audience to join in. And so I'm going to start on the right, and then we'll move to the left, but try to keep it short. And I'm interested in questions for the panelists. Understood. Rather than speeches. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, but I, I have to point out that I, I work with someone who is old enough to have been a leading target of Roy Cohn, namely Lyndon LaRouche. Uh, and Mr. LaRouche has... We can have a whole panel on Lyndon Yeah, that would be fun. That would be fun. But I'll, I promise I'll be brief. Good. Uh, I want to I put, put people on the spot over the memo that was reported by Patrick Lawrence in The Nation. Uh, I mean, I don't understand why we're talking about sort of like opinions or hypotheticals when it's been right there, documented, and I heard Bill Binney speak last week at a LaRouche event making clear that he, NSA whistleblower who designed the NSA uh, uh, techniques and programs, thinks it is technically impossible for this hack of the DNC to have taken place based on forensic evidence. So where do people stand on that point? Okay, does anyone want to comment on that? I, I'll make a brief comment. There's a big dispute about whether his uh, numbers are correct or not. So, but he raises a point that the, intelli the, the intelligence, a segment of the intelligence community had raised itself. And he reports on it in there. So it's worth people paying attention to. So I, thank you for bringing it up. I'd also mention that the nation has an excellent, I mean, afterwards had a sort of discussion and the, um, and then it linked to Truthdig, which had another very good article by Scott Ritter. There is a very interesting discussion of the, 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 the some concerns that people have in reading the um, national intelligence estimate. Unfortunately, they didn't declassify as much as I wish they had, not that I know what's there, but I, I know something about presidential records and I think there should have been more released. I will say this, okay, there is a discussion. It's not perhaps uh, where it should be. One of the problems, as I understand it, with the group of veterans that responded to this is that they're divided. And there were people like Thomas Drake who didn't agree. Scott Ritter did not sign off on this, although he wants more questions to be raised, but he th saw problems with the forensics. So the problem here is that the opposition, or the alternative view, I shouldn't say opposition, they are far firmer in their conclusions about how this is technically impossible then their evidence should lead you to conclude. And that, that is what I've taken from the debate. So the questions are interesting, but they also only refer, frankly, to Guccifer 2.0, not to the other hackers, and they only refer to one of the hackings, not to a number of other interesting hackings that would have also served Russia, like the hacking of the George Soros Foundation. So there's a lot of stuff that was going on, they're only looking at one thing. Uh, but there is a debate. Great. I appreciate that response. Now listen, there appreciate are more it. people standing Understood. than we're going to have time for. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take four questions and then we'll respond to the four and then see where we go from there. We'll start with you on the left and then you on the right, then you on the left and then you on the right. So let's make it as brief as we can. Okay, well, is this working? Yeah. Um, my name is Ellen Schrecker and I have written many books about McCarthyism. Can uh, everyone here, can you speak in the mic? Oh, 
Uh, I've written many books about McCarthyism. And um, I would disagree with some of the things that people have said, and I have some questions for some of the others. Um, probably the most quoted sentence in my main book about McCarthyism is when I say that McCarthyism was misnamed, and if we had to give it the name of a particular individual, we should have called it Hooverism. And there is no mention, was not mentioned here. There was a sort of revival of Hofstadter, I'm afraid. This uh, rather discredited theor bunch of theories about McCarthyism that it's welling up from the grassroots. And there, I mean, I'm not a conspiratorial thinker myself, except when it is there in the evidence I spent much too much time in the archives uh, not to see the, the fact that this was uh, very much a elite function coming down through the Republican Party, mainly, through uh, congressional committees, and especially through Hoover. Okay, I'm going to withdraw my suggestion that we take four if there's anyone who wants to respond to that right now. Susan, would you like to do that? Yeah. I. I uh in one sense, which is, I think, you know, when we talk about blacklisting, it is important to draw the distinction that I think you're drawing, which is between uh, officials in power who use and marshal the power of the state to chill speech, target and victimize individuals, and, you know, something we see now uh, that is much more organic. Someone like Milo Yiannopoulos, uh, you know, whether they're on the left or the right, you know, uh, going after people, rallying others. The consequences, I think the personal impact may be similar. It, you know, it, it can ruin your career, it can terrorize you, regardless of where it derives from. But I think it is a different, uh, you know, the origin is different. And I think, you know, when it comes to the power of the state and the, the, the misuse of the power of the state, you know, that triggers a different level of concern and different kinds of solutions. So I just think it's a Thank distinction. Well, Great. the only thing I would add to that is that Milo has some very wealthy backers. Right. And one of them was for a while working in the White House. Um, and so, you know, when you're looking at these people who are these sort of, you know, new freelance, whatever they are, are in fact very highly well-connected and people are funding these, you know, speak college speaking tours for them. Right. Just a Sir. quick question. Um, Putin raised an Into issue. the mic, please. Putin raised an issue about Russophobia. Uh, I think it resonated with the Russian population a lot, and I was wondering, especially for those in the media, what's the distinction made between the Russian government and the Russian people? Uh, for example, uh, I lived in Russia, in Moscow, for about ten years. I, Study, I study there, I speak the language fluently, and I understand Russians. Given that I live in London and I completed school also at NYU, I think the Russians, I see no different from the, no different between a Russian and an American. I think we all, this human co community, we all compose of that. And I don't see that in the media. I see a sense of Russian being someone else. How do you speak to that? Okay. Thank you. Anyone want to respond to that? You want to take charge for a few more? I'll try it. Okay. That's Hi. the first question. Second. Is this on? Okay. So my name is Asuka Burke. I work with uh, Linda LaRouche. I think the question here is who is orchestrating a new Cold War pitching United States and Russia? Because it's very dangerous if it is the case. Uh, you know, unlike the last, but the past cases, it's going to pose a threat of human extinction. Now, during the 80s, during the height of Cold War, Lyndon LaRouche was working with Reagan to negotiate a proposal called a Strategic Defense Initiative uh, to work out the situation with Soviets to really end the Cold War. And interestingly, interestingly he was, uh, well, railroaded to jail under Robert Mueller. Now everybody know he is the same guy who is now headhunter of Get Trump op operation. So if you look at these Mueller, Brennan, Clapper, or some other you know so-called so-called deep state, but what we what we call them you know in Larouche when we call them 
British Empire faction because th what they do is divide and conquer. Now, shouldn't there be, I mean, I know there's a lot of differences in opinion here, but shouldn't there be actual investigation from the White House into the network who forged this Russia gate? Okay, thank you. I'm gonna take just two more questions and then we'll let anyone on the panel who wants to respond do it. And I apologize to the other people online that we're not gonna be able to get to you because I've been given my orders about when we're supposed to cut this off. So, All right, sir. fine. Uh, I once served Lynn Marcus a block away when he called himself Lyndon, before he called himself Lyndon. So I wanted to put that in the mix here. It just made me laugh to hear that. Uh, two questions. First of all, 1946, the Republican Party gains 55 seats in the House. And we fast forward to the situation we have now. We have the red map argument by Rove in 2010, which essentially has structurally made it a lock for the Republican Party for the next 10 years to control every single level of government. So I wonder what the, can, what the panel would think about the McCarthy period as opposed to the Trump period now. And secondly, the issue of uh, the neo-Nazi and racist right we have now. 1946, they weren't walking around demonstrating with a swastika. Now we have a situation where they're running around like the weathermen before they went underground, uh, acting in a vanguardist way and very upfront about what they want to do. So how do you see that contrast? Because we don't have a situation where some of these guys are so upfront and very, up, very, out, very much focused in and I use vanguardist in the Leninist way because that's exactly what they're saying themselves. Thank you. I, I Last, hey, my name yes, is Irving sir. Lee. Uh, I just want to uh, point out that I think the, the question of the Cold War, I don't think the Cold War really ended. Um, I think given the, uh, the move of the Soviet Union, uh, the United States have, uh, had aggressively expanded NATO eastward. Number one, they've uh, started wars in the Middle East and in Yugoslavia and they deindustrialized Russia. So that to me, the Cold War never ended. And I think once Putin came into power, that's when he started to see the repression against, for example, Stephen Cohen, who basically sees that problem, that this, this repression comes in again. I think that the issue of um, us uh, thinking that the Russians interfere with our elections is kind of absurd given our government's role interfering other nations' elections and governments. I think that's hypocritical, for one thing. And I think I, we should focus on who are the forces in our government that are pushing this position. It's clear that the there neocons... Is a question, sir? Yeah, I just want to say, the perspective, it's clear that the neocons, many of them who happen to be Jewish, by the way, I don't know if you know this, are pushing this anti-Soviet position despite the fact that it was Russia that defeated Nazi Germany. They're the ones that bore the brunt. So I just want to point those aspects to everyone here and see what they think about it. Thank you. Okay, I want to. Mr. Mr. Panel, Chairman, so I, my apologies to the I, I other think people I have on the some line. Information my to apologies share. to the other people on the line. Very important. But I want to give the panelists a chance to respond. Oh. We have we have four more minutes, so feel free. I'm going to start on my left here. Sarah, you want to start? You're doing this to me. Um, in 1946, they didn't have swastikas, but they had white hoods. This isn't, again, this isn't new. The people who are marching in Charlottesville are also in the KKK. So, again, we have, you know, very old American traditions of violent white supremacy. We don't have to import them from overseas. Um, I, I keep just going back to actually what Ellen was saying, because Hooverism, um, I think, is important here. And I think we... Um, thinking about the elite power behind a lot of these people, um, again, doesn't... It, sounds like it can be a conspiracy, but the fact that, uh, you know, Steve Bannon wound up working with Donald Trump after running Breitbart News is not an accident. And, you know, he's out now, sort of. I didn't watch the interview the other day. But thinking about whether and how these, um, these unofficial attempts to blacklist, I mean, Donald Trump's press secretary is saying that reporters should be fired for insulting him. So the question of when, this, when and how this is going to connect to state power is one that I think we still Good. need to consider. Good. Steve, you have any, what? anything you want to add what? to this? We're, what? we're winding up. You so. already got me in enough trouble, so. Good. I'm a little worried what you're going to say next to my wife. So I'm not going to say that Bobby Kennedy was a big friend of Roy Cohen, and what does that prove? 
I mean, going fishing for evidence in history is, you know, capricious. Uh, I got a problem having grown up in the Jim Crow South. I, I saw a lot worse when I was a kid. I mean, Trump couldn't have hacked it among the crackpot politicians in the Jim Crow South. I mean, he's just another crackpot politician and not all that interesting to me. Been there, done that, seen it. I just can't get too wound up about this. These Nazis and these white supremacists, I mean, I went to school. I, I went to school with their kids. I mean, what am I supposed to do about it? And they had terrific floats in the 4th of July day. They all were out in their starched robes, and it said the Jews sold them the, the, the robes. I don't know. Uh, here's where I come down. I'm just an evidence guy. I just think we stand or fall on the credibility of our evidence. And that's why when Victor Navasky said I could write a monthly column at the nation called Sovieticus in the 1980s, 900 words a month, not one word more and be on time, I called it scholarly journalism. I, had a, I wasn't the first, but I was first in America to try this. Because I saw that among the best journalism and the best scholars, I mean, you've either got the facts, verifiable, you can put them down there. So I come down to this. The foundational document of Russiagate today, Tim, is the January 2017 Intel assessment report that was published. And then Trump and Clinton, and that Trump was briefed on it and everybody. Uh, the, the document was, is published, you can go look at it. It's about 15 pages or so. There are no forensic evidence in it, none whatsoever. The FBI did not check the computers. They just didn't do it. We don't know why, we can guess. They hired a firm, CrowdStrike, which has itself withdrawn a number of its conclusions about malware or something, I don't know. The other half of it was a six-page denunciation of RT, this Russian TV network, and it was an FBI report drawn up five years before, in 2012, and half the broadcast weren't even on the air anymore. And I think that any of us, the doctor who says, I gotta go have some surgery, you know, the police investigator who produces evidence for a court case, a professor, a journalist, would look at that document and said it didn't float. And it was not 17 intelligence agencies. We now know that. We know it was Clapper plucked a couple guys, 24, out of the CIA and the FBI, and they drew up that thing. And even though today our careless media still says it was the consensus of American intelligence, it wasn't. It just wasn't. So I evoke the new Fifth Amendment. I am now, not now, nor have I ever been a supporter of Donald Trump. Right. But I've always been a supporter of facts, and there aren't any facts. And when you do this sort of thing without any facts, in the hope that you might find some facts, that is really dangerous. And leave aside the fact that we are too close to war with Russia. Thank you. Susan? Um, I appreciate the point about the Russian people, and I think you know, one of the real dangers here is that a collateral consequence of the deterioration in relations, and I don't think it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly not solely a function of uh, the, the influence attempts nor the investigation, uh, but it's broader than that, is that those relations are being cut off and it's become very difficult to get visas and, uh, you know, that person-to-person -person contact that's so important at a time like this is being stanched. I think the emboldening of hate speech that we've seen over the last uh, year is a grave problem. It may not be new to somebody who grew up in the Jim, in the Jim Crow South, but it is, uh, it's, it's new to young people and it's alarming and destructive and I think it deserves to be taken very seriously. You know, I'm with you uh, as an evidence person, but I see the investigations that are underway and particularly uh, the bipartisan investigations where there's a deep commitment to try to come to bipartisan conclusions in both the Senate and the House. 
uh, as well as Mueller's investigation. I, I think, though, you know, I think to say I'm an evidence person, I'm a fact person, but to start investigating when you don't have the facts, to me, that's that's a little convoluted. You know, to me, you investigate to get the facts, and we'll see where the facts lead. And you know, at that point, we may we may agree, but we don't know that yet. Thank you, Susan. Tim, uh, um, I appreciate Ellen's point about the importance of of Hoover and, and and the elite at the time. One of the I think one of the lessons of the experience we've all been going through is that elite opinion. Uh, if the elites were defining the opinions, I don't think we would have the opposition to NAFTA. A lot of the issues that came out in the 2016 campaign are not at all elite views. In fact, the entire Republican Party was trying to figure out how to, de how to defeat Trump. So if, if, one, if there's one thing about this, is that it's a, a complicated relationship between culture and, and structure. And the Russians, the Soviets undertook um, active measures and in, in, influence campaigns throughout the Cold War, but they were rarely successful. There are a couple of instances. They, they increased American concerns about who killed JFK, and they, and we know this because Gorbachev later apologized, they were behind the myth that AIDS was a biological weapon that was created in Fort Detrick. That was a Soviet disinformation campaign, which Gorbachev later apologized for having known about. We happen to be more susceptible now than we were to influence campaigns. And that is troubling. And what is it about our country right now that makes us so susceptible to these kinds of ideas and has led us to this moment of high partisanship and I think uh, social instability? That doesn't mean that Hofstetter's right. I don't know if he's right about the way, the was, the way it was, but I think right now, we're in a period of real tumult um, socially. Thanks. Great. Listen, this panel it was the ultimate comment on what's wrong with the mainstream media, because what you've heard here today, you won't hear in the mainstream media. So I want to thank all the panelists, and I want to thank this conference.